Paradise, California is a sleepy mountain community nestled in the foothills between the Cascade and Sierra Nevada mountain ranges. In recent years, it's become synonymous with one of the most severe climate disasters in California's modern history. The campfire was an unprecedented impact on, on a community. I was born and raised in Paradise. The house I was born in, every house that I grew up in, every house that I ever spent time in, all of my friends' house, all of my family house that ever lived in Paradise were completely destroyed. The campfire devastated Paradise in 2018, leaving hardly anything in its path and searing the surrounding landscape. Three years later, many in the community are thinking about the future. What is the best way for Paradise to protect itself from wildfire risks? Leaders in the community are turning to nature for the answers. My name is Eli Goodsell. I'm the director of the CSU Chico Ecological Reserves. Post campfire, I really had a, a moment of reflection on how we best could serve our communities. I really realized that doubling down on the work that we're doing around forest stewardship and forest health uh, was really the work that needed to happen. Eli and the team he leads are part of a network of institutions that are working to heal the community while preparing for future wildfires. The work that we do here at the Ecological Reserve in, in respect to wildfire resilience is really we feel like we're preparing the next generation of land stewards, which for us in a Mediterranean climate means fire. On this day in the reserve, a crew of land stewards are preparing for a prescribed burn a method of putting fire on a designated area to increase the health of the forest and mitigate future wildfire risk. We do a lot of things at the Ecological Reserve, but one of our main focuses is fire because of living in a Mediterranean climate. The way that our organic materials are processed in the Western United States is through fire. We're not like the East Coast where it's wet enough that you know things are decomposing in the forest through rot and decomposition. Uh, really, that, that carbon cycle comes from um, fire in our landscapes. This kind of thinking about the future of Paradise has made its way into public policy as the Paradise Recreation and Park District creates its own plans for a nature-based approach to wildfire resilience. Looking at the campfire and lessons learned is that there's a whole bunch of things that we could do as a park district to help improve the community, improve the safety. We've latched on this idea of a risk reduction buffer and basically it's a, it's a green belt type space except it has multiple benefits. These risk reduction buffers would be similar to your typical public park except they would be managed using the same methods Eli and his team practice on the reserve, including prescribed burning, maintaining a clean understory, and encouraging the growth of fire-resistant vegetation. This, combined with their strategic location, would help keep a wildfire at bay, using nature to protect homes and communities. They had a campfire, uh, which started in this region here, just outside of our district boundaries, raced up that canyon and then started spotting fire two, three miles away. That set of circumstances is going to be with us. Uh, steep canyons, high winds, and uh, you know, changing climate that's allowing for drier conditions are, are going to be with us. By taking a bird's eye view of the campfire's footprint, Dan has identified strategic properties and areas that are ideal for a buffer park. Many sit at the wildland urban interface, protecting communities that are adjacent to wild areas. We're gonna head up towards Paradise Lake. Really good example of how very modest land management actually helped uh, combat some of the, the worst effects of the campfire. Uh, this is a rough site right now. There's a lot of dead standing wood. There is a little bit of infrastructure roads that are in disrepair. If I use a little bit of a time machine on this and what it looks like as a park in the future, this would be a more shaded fire break. There'd be larger trees. There would be more oaks in here and an understory that would be much more open. Forest scarring and evidence of the campfire is also useful insight for future resilience parks. Areas where there is less tree mortality are key to understanding how the buffers would work. Pre-campfire, if you looked at both sides of these roads, um, they will look the same. And, and now what you see have now is a situation where a lot more mortality occurred on the eastern side of the road here, the upwind side. And then when you go further west, there's a lot more tree survivorship. 
There are a dozen properties that the district is working to acquire, totaling around 500 acres. Many sit atop steep slopes and take into consideration the natural behavior of fire to help defend the community. So how does a small district come up with the funding and resources necessary to execute an ambitious project like this? The way that we're approaching it is strictly through willing sellers. There's a lot more responsibility, a lot more obligation post campfire on landowners that are in these high risk areas to help protect uh, themselves in the community. There's a lot of sensitivity around approaching a landowner uh, that may have not yet decided what they're gonna do with their land. Nevertheless, Dan has found that there are doors opening for these new ideas. One thing that's been very validating for us is talking with landowners, talking with the community, that they've arrived at a similar idea. Property donations have gotten the project off the ground in its early stages. But the reality is that the district must execute a large number of real estate transactions to scale the project up to its goal, and that takes resources. Our funding sources right now is a, is a patchwork. We're creating a, you know, basically little uh, mosaic of different funding to this endpoint. Now what we're looking at is a landscape that is prone for fire, and we're looking at what would we do two decades before fire. Putting the district on this kind of track, one that is thinking decades into the future, is the kind of reorientation that Dan is looking for. The project has support from the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation, and Dan has a solid network of partners in the region, including the Nature Conservancy. Our approach at the Nature Conservancy is our work, we strive to have it benefit both people and nature. And the science tells us that buffer areas, we know that they work to help reduce risk. There's a lot of attention on Paradise, which means there's also a lot of funding available. So if we can help steer that funding and policy changes that emanate from lessons learned in Paradise and then transfer those lessons to other communities, then it's a win-win. With such a large and ambitious project like the Paradise Buffer Project, there are some hurdles, but also some real opportunities um, to, to reimagine how we do planning. These methods have been taking place for thousands of years. In fact, the very practices that we see on the reserve today and that would be crucial to the Buffer Park project are derived from indigenous practices. And there's been a push to make sure local tribes have a seat at the table. My name's Hilo and I'm Machupta. I'm a member of the Machupta Indian tribe, which is the tribe that is indigenous to the Big Chico Creek watershed and the Butte Creek watershed. My family has been living in this area of Butte County uh, since time immemorial. It's important to engage tribes with uh, current land management practices because a lot of our current knowledge and our current practices are derived from Native American practices. Since the campfire, there has been a dramatic shift in this local area. A lot more people are wanting to know more about fire science, more about fire mitigation methods, more about prescribed fire. People in this area might not use the term cultural burning, uh, but they've been talking about things such as we need to burn like the natives did. So they're well aware of the fact that we uh, maintained the forest health through fire and that this needs to be done again. The process of doing that isn't as well known and the hurdles to doing that are not as well known, but there is a lot more conversation about it and a lot more political drive. Nature can be used not only as a resilient solution, but also as a planning tool and as a source of healing. These are the common threads shared by all those working for a safer future for paradise. For almost a century, the de facto policy has been fire suppression. But the idea here is to turn that on its head, to accept fire as a necessary and inevitable part of the landscape and to proactively manage it. While incorporating these techniques, communities can learn from and elevate indigenous practices that have been in use for centuries. This type of project can also create jobs and provide open space assets that connect residents to nature on an everyday basis. Taken together, these tactics are key to adapting and becoming more resilient.